Welcome to Spinning Back Click, where each week here at MMA Junkie, we take a spin through the biggest headlines in the sport. This week, we've got Mike Bond up in Toronto, Nolan King out there in Boston, and goes right here with me in Las Vegas. So guys, let's just jump into it. This past weekend's UFC 266 card saw featherweight champ Alexander Volkanovsky pick up a hard-fought win over a very game Brian Ortega, and it seems like Volk is finally getting a little bit of respect as UFC champion. Now, afterward, he pointed to the upcoming matchup between Max Holloway and Yair Rodriguez as a potential number one contender fight for him moving forward, but he also got some social media challenges from the likes of Conor McGregor and Henry Cejudo. Now, look, I'm not sure how realistic some of those options are, but let me ask you, what fight would intrigue you the most for Alexander Volkanovsky moving forward were it to make it happen? Let's put four minutes on the clock. Mike, you can get us started. Well, yeah, first of all, I mean, let's give Alexander Volkanovsky his flowers. That was an incredible fight, an incredible performance. Uh, he deserves all the credit and respect that people have been shortchanging him. As far as what's next, I think the Max Holloway fight will always be the most intriguing to me. Uh, they could scratch that Yair Rodriguez fight and just put that trilogy together right now. And I think everyone would be prepared to watch it. Doesn't even feel like Max has to do this fight. And it's kind of interesting the timing of when it became official. But nevertheless, it seems like that's going to happen. So, uh, let's see who comes out of there. Obviously, if Jair, Jair Rodriguez can pull off the upset there, uh, he's in a great spot and more than deserving. So I think that's kind of your sole number one contender fight. But you kind of mentioned those other names. Uh, the Henry Cejudo thing, I can't lie, it does intrigue me a little bit just because the potential of a you know first three division UFC champion, Henry Cejudo would sell the fight, the body types, all those things. So like if he can come back and the UFC can make it work, I think all of us would be interested in that, but is it realistically going to happen? I don't know. Anytime Dana White gets asked about Henry Cejudo, he's like, that guy's retired. So uh, we know the reason Henry left was because he wasn't particularly pleased about his contract. So I've gotten no indications that the UFC is willing to rip up his current deal and give him something better. And I think unless that happens, we're going to be at a standstill with Henry Cejudo. So yeah, I'm all about that Max Holloway, Volk third fight. And if Rodriguez can do something spectacular, bring it on. Yeah, and you talk about giving respect to Volkanovski. How about just the fact that he's even willing to say, yeah, I'll fight Max Holloway again. I respect the heck out of her going out there and fighting top contenders, and I'll face him again. You, you got to like that attitude. Nolan, what about you? What's the, what's the matchup that intrigues you the most, if you could put it together? Well, I think Mike hit it right on the head. I mean, Max Holloway, Yair Rodriguez, uh, it just seems like a number one contender fight. Uh, it's really tough to argue uh, that it would be anything else. I mean, if Henry is serious about coming back, then – yeah, I think that that fight could could be the one. That could be the one that slides in. I mean, Volkanovski's already beat Holloway twice, but Max is coming off of arguably the most impressive performance of his career, which is saying something, uh, considering all the great performances he had as champion, to be able to to have that accolade be, you know, after you lose two straight title fights uh, against and, and go out there and beat Calvin Cater the way he did. If he adds Yair Rodriguez to that, uh, you know, if he turns the win into a winning streak with Yair Rodriguez, then he's got even a stronger case. Um, and for Cejudo right now, I just kind of feel like it's the boy that cried wolf. I know it's part of his gimmick, uh, but it does kind of wear on you a little bit when somebody continues to hint that they're going to come back and you just can't take them seriously. I mean, sure, there's the, uh, the the gimmick aspect of what Henry's doing, but there is a reality to it, which is like, you know, people do want to see him fight again. So for him to keep saying that he's going to fight or whatever and it not really be the case, I don't know. It's just it's not something that necessarily appeals to me. I'd like to stick within the division. I'd like the Max Holloway versus uh, Yair Rodriguez winner to be the one to go on and fight Volkanovski. I think either either matchup would be great and one that uh, would certainly intrigue me. The boy that cried wolf is pretty hilarious and pretty accurate because that's the thing is, I'm going to be honest with you, I think that Henry Cejudo fight is the one that most intrigues me, but he calls out everybody, so I don't know if it's realistic. Goes, what do you think? What do you want to see happen? Well, I understand why people want to see the Max Holloway fight, and I'm kind of on board with that as well. What I'm not on board with is, what if he wins that fight? That means we're going to see it a fourth time because they got to fight again. I don't know that I want to put myself in that position. So I think it eventually will happen, but I don't want to see it too soon. If everything's on the table, I like Henry Cejudo. I really like that. Give him – you can build a storyline there, give him the opportunity to fight – for a third belt, we all know that he fights the best when he's properly motivated. I think they will give him some money for that fight. I think there's something to fight for. And how about Volkanovski? He's he's uh, erasing all the doubts in surviving a great striker like Max Holloway, then surviving all the submissions from Ortega. That says a lot about his game. But how about surviving a world-class Olympic-style wrestler? I think that's a great storyline. I would go with Cejudo. 
goes, you're not willing to set up the uh, best of seven series between Volkanovski and Holloway. I, <laughs> no, I tell you what, like you said, you never know what Henry Cejudo is saying. If there's any, you know, fact to it whatsoever, it could even happen. But if it is, I'm telling you, Henry Cejudo, if you're not just playing with us this time, come put this fight together because I would love to see that one. Guys, the flip side of that main event, of course, was Brian Ortega, who very nearly became UFC champion with a guillotine choke that looked destined to end the contest. But Volkanovski somehow survived the choke, and then he went on to devastate T-City with just non-stop striking. So the question is, where does Ortega go from here? I mean, he absorbed more than 200 strikes in this loss, as well as the loss to Max Holloway. And those guys don't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. They're going to be at the top of the division. They're going to be right there. Should Ortega keep trying to go through these guys? Should he change up the vision? Should he change up a style? What's the path here for Brian Ortega? No, let's put four minutes on the clock. You can get it started. I'm going to be that guy. I know probably everybody watching expects somebody on this panel to say it, but I'm not really interested in seeing him really fight anybody at this point. I mean, it, it went to it went to uh, to show everyone what a layoff can do uh, in, of inactivity when he took a period of time off after that Max Holloway fight. I mean, he took a beating when those two fought. And he took more than enough time after that off, and it seemed to pay off. I mean, he came back, had one of the best performances of his career against the Korean Zombie. So for me, I don't really want to see him fight anybody in the immediate future. I kind of think matchmaking for him right now doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense because whenever he comes back, I think the division's going to be in a different place. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think he's somebody that's going to have to take a huge step back or fight somebody unranked or anything like that. You can still give him a top contender, maybe somebody that's in the five to seven range or maybe number four or something like that when he comes back. But when you go out there and you start taking career, potentially career altering, uh, you know, punishment, I think you need to, to a lot, a certain layoff time after that. And I think he was smart the first time. And I'd like to see him do that again. Yeah, honestly, not a bad recommendation. Give him some time off. I mean, you don't have to make decisions. I'm sure he wants to get back in there and erase that terrible feeling, but let's not rush to it right now. Excellent recommendation goes. What do you think? What's, what's the path here for T city? Man, I can almost hear that Modelo music playing in the background and Brian Ortega being given another choice. And that choice, I think he has to take it. I, I agree with what Nolan says. He needs to go away for a while. When you think about it, he probably got paid pretty well for this fight. He also had a stint with the Ultimate Fighter. So I think he's been able to make a little bit of money. But this is a cruel sport. And what his body went through was a lot of trauma. And people look at the physical trauma that he went through. But how about the mental trauma, right? He's been so close on two occasions and, and he's failed. And that's something that he has to deal with. He has to figure out what it was that went wrong. Now, granted, they're against two guys that are going to go down as probably some of the best featherweights that ever lived on this planet. So there's no shame there. But if I'm him, I probably take a trip, something where you can combine a little bit of a vacation, but at the same time, get better. Maybe go to Thailand for a couple of months, work on your striking, go somewhere and immerse yourself in wrestling. You have to add some kind of new wrinkle to your game. Uh, to get better, to be able to compete with these guys, because it's going to be a long road back. I think he needs to take at least a year off, come back, and maybe face one of these, a Calvin Cater, a Dan Ige, somewhere, somewhere along those lines, and then build yourself back up from there, but definitely time off. Yeah, I agree. I, look, I, it, some wrestling, I think, would be helpful, right? I mean, he got to that position. I don't want to say by accident, but it was in a scramble. You know, if he could put it there more often, I think that would be helpful. But what do you think, Mike? I mean, so far, I haven't heard anybody say he needs to change weight classes. Are you thinking he needs to go to, to lightweight or, ooh, I don't know about bantamweight, but it, does he need to change or can he can he be successful where he's at? I mean, he can't make bantamweight. Um, lightweight, I know he's talked about how big of a 145er he is before, and it's a lot of weight to cut and stuff, but... Uh, for him, man, like seeing these past couple fights, you look at those lightweights, like those guys only hit harder, are slicker at boxing, things like that. Like, I don't think the issues we're seeing with Brian Ortega right now are based on weight class. It's based on different deficiencies in his skill set. And Brian Ortega is an amazing fighter. Don't get me wrong. Like he has done some really great things, but he just takes too much damage in there. It really ultimately comes down to that at this point. Um, even if you look at some of his earlier UFC wins, he was losing fights for two rounds and then would catch a guy in a submission in the third. Like this guy has a real inclination for taking damage. And this is a bad, bad sign at this stage of his career, 30 years old. He needs to make some, I think, dramatic changes in terms of his training, his in-fight strategy, all that kind of stuff but uh, is that going to help he could do everything in the world and i don't know if i pick him to beat alexander volkanovsky or max hallway he's kind of just the alexander gustafson of this division right now when john jones and daniel cormier were hanging around at 205 so it's a tough spot for brian ortega i don't empathize with him here it's uh what's what's he gonna do i think you just need to 
keep going on the journey, try to get better. And uh, he does have some ceilings right now in this division, and that's a tough spot for him. Mm, interesting comparison with Gustafson there. Yeah, it is a difficult spot for him, but still a very, very talented fighter. And I listen, I kind of agree. I think you are. They don't need he doesn't need to panic and, and go to another weight class. You know, well, I think we thought Max Holloway could be a, a lightweight, right? We said, oh, yeah, he'll be fine. And then he went there. We thought, oh, my gosh, that doesn't look right at all. So, uh, listen, hopefully you can make some revisions and keep it there because he is still, as you said, a very talented talented fighter you guys also usc 266 the co-main event saw valentina shevchenko continue her domination of the usc women's flyweight division afterwards of course the name amanda nunes was brought up in terms of potentially booking the trilogy fight between them is this a fight that needs to happen now do we need to get these two together for a third time let's put four minutes on the clock goes what do you think i think this fight needs to happen soon but i don't think it has to happen next i think valentina took a huge step forward in her marketability. She developed this little bit of swag. I don't know if you guys noticed, but even at the end of the fight, standing over her opponent with her arms up, the dance, thanking every country in their own native language. I mean, people really seem to dig her. I think she took a step forward. But the thing is, we can't get excited for a fight that you're not asking for. I think we need Valentina Shashenko because it's not going to come from Amanda Nunes. Those are two of her toughest fights ever. I'd like her to throw that name out and just say, listen, I'm going through all these people in my division. I need to be challenged. I want that fight back. I think that will get people going. And I think that will maybe give a little bit more motivation to the UFC to make this matchup because the fans definitely want it. I think the media, I think we would be happy seeing it again, but it's got to come from the fighters, guys. If we're willing to see Holloway and Volkanovsky do it again, then this is kind of right along those same lines. I'd love to see this fight happen again. Um, the divisions are just about nearly cleared out. So I wouldn't say right now, but probably the next fight after the next fight. It is interesting because I feel like in the past, whenever Amanda's name got brought up, Valentina just like blew it off and didn't want to talk about it. Now she seems at least open to the discussion, but she doesn't necessarily, as you said, be, be calling for the fight, which is, I think, what would generate some real interest. So, Mike, what do you think? Is it time to book it or, or does it does it not need to happen? I'm torn on this one. I mean, I want to see it. Obviously, I think it's one of the you know most significant fights that can be made in women's MMA history. I mean, look what these two are doing in their divisions. I understand why Valentina is more just like, if they bring it to me, I'll sign it. But I'm not out here, as Go said, like beating the door down, bringing up Amanda's name in every interview, this, that, and the other thing. Because look what Valentina's done right now. I mean, she is on such a roll. She has this aura of being untouchable, being this killer. Even if she goes up and she loses to Amanda again, she can come back and keep doing her thing. But it's going to take a little bit away from it, in my opinion. So uh, I understand why she's okay with just staying in her lane. But I think for the sanctity of you know the pound for pound ranking for the sport we do need to see these two fight again against each other i just don't know what the timing and the circumstances are going to be are they going to have a difficult time getting amanda nunez to agree to it what's the incentive on her side she already has two wins over valentina that she can hold on to and you know retire and go off into the sunset with she doesn't need to give her this third opportunity so what does the ufc do do they sweeten the bag and you know give them both a ton of money to make it happen is there enough fan interest that they had recoup this money so i think there's a lot of things that go into the making of this third fight i would love to see it anytime any day i just don't know how close we are to it in reality yeah mike you said it you're torn that's the way i feel about it because it's sure it'd be a big fight but there's something to be said for just dominating a division for a long time i think sometimes you know we've gotten so tuned into this champ champ stuff that we we worry about that too much instead of sustained dominance so nolan what do you think does this fight need to happen yeah, I think it does. And I'm not the person that would be calling for champ champ fights. I think a lot of times they clog up divisions. But I think the time to do them is when you have two champions that have been so dominant that there's not really those fights out there that you say, hey, if these two fighters, if these two champs fight, so and so contender from Division X is going to be, you know, snubbed and they're going to be have to wait extra and they're going to be screwed and they're going to log jam, all that stuff. I don't think that that's the case right now. I mean, if Amanda goes out there and beats Juliana Pena, to me, I mean, you can keep you can keep recycling these contenders over and over again, but Valentina's kind of wiped out her division too. So if you were going to make this fight, I'm not necessarily sure that the uh, the stars would align as well going forward. You never know what's going to happen. You never know which contender's going to emerge. So to have it be that like both of them right now don't really have contenders that are that people are dying to see, I, I think why not? You know, I think it's a great fight, and obviously it would it would be a bigger fight than the first couple times that they fought. It's it's not a, a bad point in the day. 
we're not calling for any other fights for either one of them, right? I mean, they, they seem to be the only fight for it. I'm just so torn. Like, like I said, I, I'd love to see somebody just continue to dominate divisions. But like you said, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for either one of them right now that we're calling for. So maybe we'll see it again. Sure would be a big one. Yes, of course, USD 266 was also very much about the return of Nick Diaz, though the heavily anticipated rematch with Robbie Lawler did have a very anticlimactic ending we'll say it was a crazy week from start to finish we had the the media day no show we had a an unplanned division change in the fight we had some some head scratching interviews both before the fight and after the fight of course just a bizarre result in the ending itself so uh, a lot to talk about so we'll just ask this what was your biggest takeaway the one thing that you're taking away from the whole experience in itself mike let's put four minutes on the clock you get it started I guess my biggest takeaway would be I do not want to see this again out of Nick Diaz unless there is radical changes. Uh, to me, this whole fight week, it was great to have Nick back and everything, but it just felt like a deteriorated version of everything from his physical shape to how he acted in the interviews to the fighting and everything. Like all of the glimpses of the Nick Diaz of old were still there, but it was just a far dragged down version that kind of made me uncomfortable to see. Um, he had some moments in this fight. I'm not one of the people who's sitting here saying Nick Diaz looked like trash. He's washed all that kind of stuff. I think there was some stuff in there, especially given a six year layoff uh, that you can be okay with. So like, I just don't know who he fights going forward. Like I was doing my matchmaker piece for MMA junkie the day after the fight. And I'm looking at welterweight I'm looking at middleweight and I'm like, who, who is this guy going to fight? It just doesn't really feel like the UFC roster is constructed to have Nick Diaz at this place in his career right now, unless you want to feed him to some killer and be like, here it is. You're gone to me. Like, I guess you could do that, but that's not what the right fit is. So I just don't know. Maybe they part ways. Um, there, there's so many questions here. What's his motivation for fighting? There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff you hear. So just so much going on, but right now, current version, what we saw, I would be completely okay if we never saw, uh, this Nick Diaz experience again. Hmm. Interesting. Like you said, change. I think that's the biggest thing, right? Is why was he in there? Did he want to be in there? Did he have to be in there? Were people forcing him to telling him to, I don't know. It was tough for me to tell his motivation. So I'm not sure. Nolan, what do you think? What was your biggest takeaway from this whole, whole week? Well, my biggest takeaway, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, on one hand, I think Nick Diaz maybe has a little bit more left in the tank than I expected. But on the other hand, he's going to take it seriously if, if uh, he wants to have some success going forward. And, you know, we saw in the lead up to this fight when he was lobbying kind of publicly or his team was on social media, hey, look at the great shape that he's in. He's taking this seriously. He's focused. And then that was not really the guy that showed up this week. Uh, and if you had told me that, I would have said, hey, you know, Robbie's going to go out there and just kill him off the bat. And we started to see that at the beginning when Robbie was swarming him. But throughout the span of that fight, I mean, Nick was more competitive than I expected him to be uh, from the time that I saw him step on the scale and maybe not look as, as good as we expected. So it is. A, it was just a really weird fight for me to try to figure out. I mean, usually even with Legends fights, you can kind of figure out where somebody might go. With Nick, it was, it was very weird because I thought the physical skills were still kind of there. He obviously, the technique, you could tell his boxing combinations were pretty sharp. He's still very durable. But on the flip side, uh, it just looked like he somebody was like forcing him to be in there, you know, just from his comments on the microphone afterwards saying he doesn't know how the fight got set up. Like that whole thing was just so weird, just head scratching every time that he said it. And then on the physical side too, it perhaps looked like he didn't necessarily put 110% into his preparation. So it's going to be, I don't really know what to do with them next. If he came back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, angry or anything. And if he stepped away, I, I wouldn't either. So I have no idea what's what, what the future holds. So tough to tell. Like you said, it's obvious there's something there. We just don't know how much goes a legend. What did you take out of this? Thank you for calling me a legend, John. I appreciate that. But Nick Diaz, it's great too. The thing that stuck in my head was the fact that I feel like he could give us a little bit more but at welterweight, not at middleweight. If it's something that he can take serious and kind of stay in that martial arts frame, um, I think he can give us a little bit more. But I'm kind of with Mike and Nolan on this, that frame of mind that he was in, the things he was saying, I hate doing this, and you could see the level of anxiety, that made it way tougher for me to see him take the damage that he took in that fight. It just made it sad at some point, you know, to know that somebody's doing something that they just do not like one bit. As the fight wore on, and I think he heard, heard the roar of the crowd, a little bit of that old Nick Diaz might have came out, and I want to know if that carries over. But the Diaz brothers never strike me as guys that 
say what they want next. I think he collects a paycheck until he runs out of money and he does it again. But I, I hope we don't see it too soon. Yeah, I'm torn. I, like you said, I, it's there's still some there. And if he wants to be in there, I think he deserves the opportunity. As we all said, there was something there. But if he's doing it because he has to or somebody's making it to, I, I, I don't know. It just I don't want to see any more of that. And I also knew you were going to take advantage of that setup as soon as I heard the words coming out of my mouth. So well done on that, Ghost. As Bellator has a big event this weekend in London, and it features a key headlining rematch between former middleweight champ Douglas Lima and the always entertaining Michael Vinapage. High stakes, but who really has more on the line here? It wasn't that long ago that Lima was going for champ champ status, but now he's on a two-fight losing streak. Meanwhile, people are always questioning Page's legitimacy, and they point to his loss as Lima as proof that he's not really an elite level fighter. So who needs this win more? Let's put four minutes on the clock. Nolan, you get us started. I think uh, the former champion Douglas Lima needs this win more. Uh, to me, if he goes out there and loses to Michael Venom Page, who he's already defeated once, it looks like a big step back. I mean, to go out there, lose to Musasi, then lose your title to Yaroslav Amosov, and then to lose to Michael Venom Page, who you beat uh, a few years ago, to me, that would be a big blow to him. It would make people think that he's totally fallen off. For Michael Venom Page, on the other hand, it would be another uh, another bump in the road. It would be another delay towards his ultimate goal of getting to the title. But it would be more of a sidestep, in my opinion. I mean, I think people, when they think of Michael Venom Page, they think of that knockout that he suffered against Douglas Lima as part of the bigger picture of his career. So, it honestly, uh, you know, if, if that was his ceiling, I mean, that's still his ceiling. So that's kind of a sidestep. So I think this is a great fight. It was the right fight to make. They had some buildup uh, even prior to their last set of fights. They were talking some smack about a rematch. And Lima was saying MVP was running. So good on Bellator for making this fight. Good placement in London. Good main event. Um, you know, but I, I definitely think that Douglas Lima should feel a lot more pressure on his shoulders coming into a fight where, where he could uh, ultimately just be on a, a major drop off, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's a great point, right? Lima doesn't win here. Now you say, oh, is that guy, is, is he washed up or his best days behind him? Can he ever attain that anymore? But I also I also think about MVP and the doubters that are always there. So, goes. what do you think? Who's got more on the line here? This was a doozy of a question, John. I love it. Um, I think you can make a case for both, but really I'm going to make a case for MVP. I think it's bigger for him because if you look at Douglas Lima and – you see what he's accomplished. Nobody's wondering if Douglas Lima is a great fighter. We all know he's a great fighter. He's accomplished a lot. He even had a title. If his, if his career ended today, he would go down as a really good fighter. There are no question marks there. A lot of people would like to have that type of career. With MVP, he's surrounded by question marks, right? And that loss to Douglas Lima was, was very eye-opening, not just for MVP, but for a lot of fans. So, um, if Douglas Lima came out and won this fight, we expect no nothing less. He already beat him. I, I don't know that he would gain too much from that. But if MVP suffered another loss, I think a lot of people would not only question where he's at today, but they would even go back to his previous fights and go, well, what happened here? Is this matchmaking? What do we have with this guy? There's so many question marks for him, for Bellator. So I think uh, credibility is a big thing that's on the line in this fight for both guys, but I think it's going to affect MVP a little bit more. So I'm going to say... He has more to lose in this fight. I think it's a great case to make, man. I mean, this would be the eternal fuel to the fire for the doubters to say the MVP is not a real fighter, right? So, again, though, Lima needs to win. Mike, what do you think? What, who, who is it? Ah, uh, man, these guys made such great points. Uh, if gun to my head, I'm going to say MVP, just because the book is already kind of written on Douglas Lima. I mean, three-time Bellator tournament champion, a three-time welterweight champion. He's headlined so many cards. He's has over 40 MMA fights. So, like, we know what this guy is at this point. Uh, him losing three straight, of course, would not be great when we're so, like, near removed from people saying, oh, like, he should fight the UFC champion. They should do a cross-promotional fight or something. It would be a good situation for his career but we know what he's done and everything there's so many more questions around mvp they're giving him the rematch that he wanted in his home country all these things in a position where lima may be a little more vulnerable than usual so like for him if he can't win this one i think maybe people will say the story is written on mvp being like we have seen his ceiling crystal clear at this point and it's douglas lima and anything that revolves around that and i guess we're going to go back to reverting to him fighting guys that are you know unknown unranked just so he can put a highlight on them so i think if mvp wants to be taken seriously as a top level welterweight uh try to fight for that bellator welterweight title i heard his contract may 
may not be too much longer with Bellator, maybe a UFC move. So like this is hugely important if MVP wants to be taken seriously beyond what he currently is. Man, it's a great fight, and it's such a tricky spot for both guys. A lot of stakes here. It just occurred to me, too, the funny thing is with Lima, we're saying what a big fight it is for him, obviously. And if he wins, they're just going to say, hey, you beat a can. MVP's no good anyway. We already knew he was no good at 19-2. and two. You know what I mean? What a spot to be in. Look, it's it's a big fight card for Bellator. Uh, and, hey, man, maybe it's the relaunch of their commitment to Europe. I know you know it's still tough over there, but they had done so much good work on the European scene. So, Hopefully they can get that going. I know there's a lot of fighters over there that are hoping for fights. So, listen, big weekend. We got UFC. We got Bellator. Cage Warriors is doing a trilogy. You got CFFC as well. So there's a lot of fights. That'll produce a lot of storylines. And we'll talk about them all right here on Spinning Backlit.